Now, 1 John chapter number 4, look again at verse number 12 through 18. 1 John 4, 12 through 18, where the Bible says, No man hath seen God at any time. Remember, I mentioned this last week. If they claim they've seen him, they are a liar. You're going to reject what they're saying because it's not true. It's not true because the Bible says no man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelt in us and his love is perfected in us. It means it's completed in us. It has come to fruition. It's done its, its miraculous work. God's love and the gospel wants to do a work inside of you and inside of me. And it's a perfect work in the sense that it's perfectly applicable and it's, it's a completing work in that it's, it'll make us a whole as a spiritual being for Jesus Christ. Hereby, verse 13, know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelt in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God had to us. God is love. And he that dwelt in love dwelt in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect. Remember, he told us in verse 12 that his love is perfected in us. And now he tells us, herein is our love, herein is that love made perfect. The love for us. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for this time, for this wonderful church. Lord, thank you for all that you have done. And I pray that tonight you'd help us as we look at your word to glean some truth that you would touch our hearts with, Lord. Change us. Lord, do that perfecting work that only you can do. Lord, we give you the honor, the glory, and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I mentioned last week, and mentioned I'd come back to is this concept of, of fear versus faith. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casted out fear. An off-mentioned topic, I'll mention it again and again. And, and uh, I pastor told me something years, or not years ago, but a few years back. He said, he said if, you're not, if people don't think you're repeating something, then you're not saying it enough. All right? Do you remember saying that too? You probably, okay. And so if it sounds like I'm talking about fear a few times, it's because I want to repeat it so that we learn this lesson about love and God's faith and our faith in God versus our fear. I see too many people operating in fear, not in faith. Not just during this time of this pandemic, but on a regular basis. People who won't serve God because of fear. People who won't give to God because of fear. People who won't give the gospel because of fear rather than walking in faith. A few years back, there was a show. It was called Fear Factor. I remember when it was on, it was maybe 2001 to 2006. It was maybe 10, maybe 15 or so years ago or more. They said that they would introduce it this way. The little intro line would be this. It would say, imagine a world where your greatest fears become reality. Welcome to Fear Factor. But that is how we live sometimes. We imagine a world where our greatest fears become reality. And the fact is, every once in a long, 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 long while, we're right. Every once our fear actually comes to fruition. The spider's actually in the sleeping bag. Have you ever dumped your boots out because you're afraid of brown recluse spiders? I mentioned this story before, but I'll say it again. There was a time when I was fixing my uh, kitchen I had. I was running a gas line. Pastor Scott Cowling was helping me with this gas line. And as I crawled under this little crawl space, I had to crawl through some cobwebs. There was a carcass of a dead mouse, but it looked like a dead rat. It could have been a dead horse, I'm not sure, in this little crawl space. I am not, I think, typically afraid of spiders, but I had done something that I don't know why I would have possessed me to do this. I had in Bible class before that looked up the effects of the bite of a brown recluse spider. You should not, all right? Do not follow my example. You should not Google these things. I should follow my own advice because you know that only the most sensationalized pictures and the worst case scenarios are what come to the top of the search engine, all right? I had Googled brown recluse spider bites. 
And of course, picture after picture of someone, you see like their hand or their leg or their neck, and there is just a hole. Because the brown recluse venom, the poison, will actually eat your skin in, in rare cases. Rare cases, but every picture it seemed like they had. I mean, there's a thumb and it's, you know, the size of your, your bicep and the hole, right? You can like almost see through the thumb. Well, I had looked at that. I don't know why I looked this up, but I had. So there I am under in this crawl space trying. Pastor Scott is, is up in my kitchen and he's waiting for me and I'm crawling. And I'm seeing these, these, uh, these spider webs. As I moved my flashlight, I would see things scurrying all over the place. I mean, I felt like there were thousands, but it felt like hundreds, but they just seemed to scurry all over the place. And their bodies were very small, but with their legs, they were about two to four inches with their legs. Well, you can imagine where my mind went. I'm thinking this crawl space in this basement is filled with brown recluse spiders that are going to just like drop on me when I lay here on my back, feeding this flexible gas line through the floor. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have a hole in my forehead and my arm, my body, I'm going to die down here. And about that time, Pastor Kelly from upstairs is knocking on the floor like with his foot. Right above me. Spiders all over the place. Where are you at? I'm down here. What's taking you so long? Or something to that effect. And I responded with something like, there's some spiders down here. And like only a true friend can respond. Like only a true friend, someone who cares deeply about your emotional well-being, someone who wants to just raise you up and help you, you know, reach all of life's uh, uh, peaks. He said, what, you're afraid of some little spiders? Yeah. You know, here's the truth. At that moment, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, I was. I would be lying if I said no. At that moment, I was afraid of some spiders. Well, I overcame my fear because, I mean, what's, what's the greater death here? A hole in my face or Pastor Scott mocking me for the next 30 years? Obviously, I can live with a hole in my face, all right? Make a great story sometime. And I shoved the line through and I scrambled out of there. And I, I told him about what had happened when I got back up there. And he came down with his flashlight. He, in his words, wow, there are a lot of spiders down here. I looked later on online because now you know what it was in my house infested with brown recluse. They're actually called cellar spiders. They are two to four inches. They are perfectly harmless to humans, apparently. All right? And they will multiply in the hundreds and thousands in a dark space. So my, my uh, uh, counting of them in that brief moment when time stood still was pretty accurate, accurately. But not my fear. The fact is, imagine a world, we can imagine a world where our fears become a reality, yet people, Christians, good Christians, live in that world every single day. Yet my Bible says, perfect love casteth out fear. When God's love does its perfecting work in my life, when God's love completes me as a child of God and does that work, then the fear in my life is now cast out. It doesn't mean that I will never have a fear. It means that I will never operate in that fear. I have just a few statements for us tonight as we are looking challenged by this concept, perfect love casteth out fear. The first statement is this tonight, occasions for fear are actually opportunities for faith. Occasions for fear are opportunities for faith. It's all about perspective. It's all about our perspective on life. We can look at something and we can see the obstacle. We can see how big it may be, how hard it may be, how scary it may be. Or we can see how big our God is, how great He is, and what an occasion for our faith in Him to show itself strong. You see, the composition of our faith is strong. Faith in Jesus is not a weak faith. 1799, Conrad we Reed discovered a 17-pound rock while fishing in Little Meadow Creek. He took this 17-pound rock home. Apparently, he thought it looked nice. And for three years, his family used it as a doorstop, the front door. In 1802, his father, John Reed, took it to a jeweler who identified it as a lump of gold worth at that time, in 1802, about $3,600. A fortune back then. Still not a bad amount of money today, all right, but a fortune in 1802. It was one of the biggest gold nuggets ever found east of the Rocky Mountain. 
And until its composition was determined, its value was unknown. And and even so, until the composition of our faith is determined, the strength is unknown. And God sometimes allows these occasions for fear as an opportunity for our faith and really as an opportunity for us to see what faith and God can do. I love that last song we sang, Through It All. I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Sometimes there's fear in giving out a gospel tract. Now in that, when we talk about it, it seems kind of silly. But I wonder if you've felt it before. You go to give a tract out, and all of a sudden you feel, well, what will this person say? Well, 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 well will, they, will they be unhappy that I give them a tract? Will they, will they say something? Will they act rudely to me? When we actually stop and talk about it, it's quite silly, actually. For a stranger, if someone says to me as a stranger, don't give me that. Well, what offense is that in my life? I can probably live to see another day if that happens. If someone says, no, I don't want that gospel tract, well, what offense is that? Can I live another day when that? I can. Yet, there are some times, because of that fear, that I don't exercise the faith. What is faith? Faith says, God, you can take your gospel and you can multiply it. Because there have been times when I have felt that. What will they say? How will they respond? That's a well-dressed man. It's an elegantly dressed lady. They won't receive this, That yet God surprises me. Right? And they take the tract, and, and beyond that, they read it. And, and I would have thought they would have rejected it. And, and someone I thought would have received it uh, didn't want to receive it. goes to show that maybe, just maybe, I don't know everything. Maybe he does. See, opportunities or occasions for fear are opportunities for faith. Faith for a lost person having a home in heaven. I was encouraged to hear this past week that Brother Jim Clark, who works the, with our printing ministry from First Baptist Church, was able to deliver some more tracts. And since this COVID-19 pandemic, since that our state has been shut down, he's been able to deliver and give away over 500, I thought he said 541,250 or somewhere right in there, uh, tracts, somewhere in there. Over half a million tracts able to deliver and give. What an occasion for faith. Yet there are some people who, this, since it started, have not left their house. Yet Brother Clark is out, is out delivering tracts that he has printed. Praise God for that. There are times that we have fear in using my talents for the Lord. Oh, pastor, I couldn't sing. I couldn't teach. I couldn't drive that bus. You know, because a bus is scary. It is. It is when driven by some of you who drive the buses, I agree. It is scary. I I couldn't do that. I, I couldn't sing because someone will hear me. That is a true fact of life that when you sing in public, people hear you. You might, you might understand that sometimes when you sing, you may make a mistake. I've made plenty of them, and I will make plenty more. I can't teach because, uh, you know, I don't know, what, I, what, what, what would I say? And yet uh, we have story after story in this church, in this wonderful church of people who have overcome their fear. And they say, wow, so-and-so got saved in my lesson this morning, or they learn about this. What an occasion for fear turned into an opportunity for faith. Many people who are afraid with their talents found out that God can use them. Abraham Lincoln said this, I cannot speak in New Jersey at this time. I've overstayed my time and they've heard something about sickness in my family. Then he said this, but really, I am nervous and unfit to fill my engagement. Will you please excuse me? What if Abraham Lincoln never overcame his fear of speaking in public? The Gettysburg Address? Oh, some wonderful statements that he made. How about George Patton, the general, World War II? A military governor met with George Patton. And he praised Patton for his courage and bravery. And the general replied, General George Patton, he replied, Sir, I am not a brave man. The truth is, I am a coward. I have never been within the sound of a gunshot or in the sight of battle my whole life that I wasn't so scared that I had sweat in the palm of my hands. He continued to say, I learned very early in my life never to let my fears take control of me. Or maybe we say it this way, the stuff we fear can become the steps of faith. The stuff we fear can become the steps of faith. Perfect love casteth out fear. 
Occasions for fear are actually opportunities for faith. But the second statement tonight is this. It is not if we will fear, but how we will follow. It is not if we will fear, but how we will follow. Two explorers were on a jungle safari when suddenly a ferocious lion jumped in front of them. Keep calm, the first explorer mentioned. Remember what we read in that book on the wilderness. If you stand perfectly still and look in the face of a lion, he will turn and run. The second explorer apparently responded, sure. He said, you've read that book, and I've read that book, but do we know that the lion has read that book? (laughs) Sometimes that's how we feel as Christians. I know what God says. I know what I've read, but does that problem know what God says? Has that lion read the book? Will I listen to God's word or my head? Will I follow God's law or my logic? Can I read you some verses about fear from the Bible, from God's Word? Deuteronomy 31, 6. Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Isaiah 41, 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Psalm 56, 3, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. Psalm 34, verse 4, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Psalm 23, verse 4, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Psalm 27, verse 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You fear? Read the book. You're afraid? Read His Word. He talks about this. God's Word will bring the completing work of love in your life and my life. And can I ask you, what fear has God not written to us about? What terror has God not given to Himself for? It is not in my fear, but in how I follow Five-year-old Johnny was in the kitchen. Not my Johnny, just an imaginary Johnny. And his mother was making supper. She asked him to go to the pantry and get a can of tomato soup. Johnny didn't want to go to the pantry. The pantry was a dark place. She asked him again and told him he needed to go to the pantry and get the can of tomato soup for him. And then she responded with, It's okay, Jesus will be in there with you. What a good mother. Always looking for the time to teach these things. Johnny walked to the pantry and he peeked inside and he saw that it was so dark, as dark as he imagined and maybe even darker. And he remembered that his mother said Jesus would be in there with him. So he had an idea. He looked in the pantry, in the dark pantry, opened the door and said, Jesus, if you're in there, would you please hand me the can of tomato soup? (laughs) It's not an if we will fear, it's how we'll follow. Look at the word he'll teach us about the word. And the last statement tonight is this. The size of our fear is no match for the strength of our Savior. How big is your fear? Well, to each one of us, our fears are larger than life. At that moment that I'm in that crawl space, those spiders were very large, very fearful. Yet now, I know what they are. It doesn't even bother me. I have a different look at that. The size of our fear is no match for the strength of our Savior. And our mind will tell us that this fear is insurmountable. It is too large. I believe it was John Wesley one time when dealing with a man he was ministering to. He was a a very worried man, as the story goes, and would worry about everything. He he came across a cow in a field at a fence. And he said to the man, John John Wesley said to the man, Do you know why that cow is looking over the fence? The man said, no, I don't. The story goes, John Wesley replied, because he can't look through the fence. Think about that. We can't look through our fear, but we can look over to see our Savior, the size of our Savior and the strength of our Savior. 
Our Savior tells us that He will never leave us nor forsake us. And perfect love casts out fear. It says that word cast, it means we're supposed to throw it out. Perfect love eliminates that fear. It doesn't leave it in a box in the corner or on a shelf to be taken off and looked at later on. It doesn't mean that we drive it 25 miles away. It means that we take it and we boost it out of there. We kick it off the front lawn. We get it out of the house. There is no way it stays on our property. Perfect love casts out fear. It's rejected and thrown out. Our fears are no match for our Savior. His wisdom's too great, his love is too infinite, his power is too strong. His sight is too keen, and his provision is too deep. See, the love of God enables me to live boldly and courageously, to face the fears in my life that threaten to terrorize me, that threaten to paralyze me, that want to minimize me and want me to compromise. But instead, God wants to energize my faith and pulverize my fear, synchronize our mind, and maximize his power in my life. That's what perfect love does. An Indian fable, an old Indian fable, says that a mouse was in constant duress because of its fear of the cat. And so a magician took pity on the small mouse and turned the mouse into a cat. Immediately the cat, former mouse, became afraid of the dog. So the magician turned the mouse into the cat into the dog. And immediately the dog, formerly cat mouse, began to fear the tiger. And so the tiger then began to fear the hunter. Finally, as the proverb goes, the magician turned it back to a mouse. He said, be a mouse again, because you only have the heart of a mouse. And yet with Jesus Christ, we can have the heart of the Lion of Judah and the Lamb of God. There is no cat, dog, tiger, or hunter that can touch us Come close without his love, which will keep us. So tonight, my friend, do you have fear of faith in your life? Perfect love casteth out fear. If I have fear, if I operate in that fear, if I walk in that fear, then I'm showing that God's love is not doing what he wants it to do because that love kicks it to the curb, my fear. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you that we can have your power Lord, your love in our life. Thank you that that love is so powerful, Lord, it kicks our fear to the curb. Lord, help us in those ways that our mind will just run amok in this world. Lord, help us in the ways that our minds make up scenarios. Lord, help us to be honest. I wonder tonight with your heads bowed and eyes closed if there is fear in your life. Not only is there fear, is it fear that is controlling you, that you're dwelling in. It's not been cast out yet. But would you cast it out tonight? Would you come back to the Savior, have his love overwhelm you and his power to uplift you and his sound mind to control you? Oh, the word of God is quick and powerful. You don't have to live in that fear. You can live in the love of your Savior. I also wonder tonight, if you're listening tonight, I wonder if you've ever trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves you so much that He sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. The Bible says we're all sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. The payment for sin is is separation from God. But Jesus Christ paid the penalty of your sin and my sin. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And if you, my friend, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says thou shalt be saved. Saved from what? Saved from paying for your own sins. Saved from spending a day in hell. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is is eternal life, life in heaven, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. My friend, today, if you've never trusted Christ, you can trust him today. You can believe on Jesus tonight, right where you're at. You can, right now, turn your heart to him. Maybe even pray a simple prayer like this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me 
please save me and take me to heaven. I trust in Jesus and him alone. And if you from your heart could pray that, would you pray that tonight? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. Tell him, he'll hear you. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. Please save me, take me to heaven. I trust in Jesus and him alone. My friend, if you trusted Christ, if you asked him to save you just now, if you believed on him, the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But as many as believed on him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. My friend, if you trusted Christ tonight, would you do me a favor? Would you jot me a note? Would you leave me a message on your screen? You'll see a phone number, an email address, and a website. If any one of those ways you want to just throw me a quick note, jot me a note, leave me a message. Pastor, I trusted Christ as my Savior. I'd love to send you a free book. I won't ask you for your money. I don't ask you. I want to give you something. This book will help you grow as a Christian. Lord, thank you that you've done so much for us in salvation, Lord. But after salvation, you give us the grace to grow and the strength to live and the love to defeat our fear. Lord, help us to walk in that love. In Jesus' name, amen.